In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we celebrate the feast of the presentation of Christ in the temple. In older times called the purification of St. Mary the Virgin, also known as Candlemas, and I won't mention the secular holiday that February 2nd also is. But, and there are still other names for this day. Candlemas. Um, yes, St. Blaise. The fact that there are so many names reflects the wealth of spiritual meaning that generations of Christians have discovered in this one seemingly small incident reported only in the Gospel of Luke. The service in the temple to which Jesus was taken when he was six weeks old was not only the purification rite for Mary, according to Jewish law, but also a thanksgiving for the miracle of life through the presentation of the firstborn and the required dedication of this infant to God's service and ministry. Simeon and Anna receive the child with joy, a sense of fulfillment, words of warning, and thanksgiving. The whole story is rich, colorful, and layered with meaning. For all of these reasons and probably more, Jesus' presentation in the temple was a frequent subject for medieval and Renaissance artists. In oil and tempera, in huge paintings and miniatures, these artists painted their vision of God and the gospel. I meditated on a picture of one such painting before sitting down to write this sermon, all of this in Mexico, and I want to tell you a little bit about the painting. The title of the painting is The Presentation in the Temple, and the artist was a 15th century Flemish painter named Hans Memling. The first thing you might notice in gazing at this painting is that the temple does not appear as one might imagine a temple in first century Palestine. The temple in Memling's painting is unmistakably a Gothic church or even a cathedral. Then you might notice what the figures in the painting are wearing. The men are all wearing bright colors, red and gold. Simeon's costume looks almost oriental, as if Memling were trying to paint a foreigner. The women are in darker colors, Two women observing the scene are dressed in aristocratic Renaissance Flemish garb. These women are doubtless patrons of Memling's art, for artists often included patrons in their art. The old woman, Anna, and the young mother, Mary, are both wearing the habits of 15th century nuns. Mary, in particular, is not depicted as an affectionate young mother, but rather formal, sad, quiet, as she would appear at the foot of the cross. Perhaps Membling was attempting to allude to Simeon's prophetic and wrenching words to Mary in a slightly different translation, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Jesus, the 40-day-old infant, is wearing nothing. 
He is naked, vulnerable, and being handed over from the mother to the priest. As an infant, he is not clothed in the garb of first century Palestine or 15th century Europe, but could be of any time, in any century. Though I have to say that the artist has painted his skin white, and that too would be historically inaccurate. The point of me describing this painting to you, a characteristic one among many such paintings, is to articulate a tension present, not only in this scene of the presentation, but also in our own lives and relationship to God. To the artist who painted this scene, God was very near. God was for him and spoke his language, and therefore God's people dressed in the clothing of the artist's own time. God was as familiar as the church down the street or the cathedral in the next town. Yet, God was also totally other. God was the foreigner priest to whom the Christ child was given over. God was the stranger who entered their lives mysteriously and left the same way. God was the ultimate mystery. This picture and pictures like it painted the tension between familiarity and mystery as integral to the gospel. To destroy or depress one or the other was to destroy the tension of the good news that God is within us and beyond us incarnate and transcendent. The good news, that tension, the truth that God is within us and beyond us, incarnate and transcendent, is as real for us today as it was for the artist Memling and as it was for Simeon, Anna, Mary, and Joseph in first century Palestine. We cry out against the absence of God when actually God is so present that we miss God completely. We feel quite safe from a God floating around on a cloud somewhere, but we are threatened by the God who invades our home, our jobs, our relationships. The fleshliness and bloodiness of God seems many times to be an offense to human beings, yet this is what the incarnation is all about. Religious people and the politicians in Jesus' day did not want a God so present as to threaten their vested interests. Small wonder that Simeon holds the child Jesus and says, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is spoken against, that the thoughts out of many hearts will be revealed. You remember the opening line of what is commonly known as the collect for purity? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. When I heard these words as a child, I remember being both terrified and impressed. I was terrified because I secretly knew in my heart I was most often planning the demise of my wretched sister, or I was contemplating my next act of disobedience against my parents, or I was thinking about doing any number of things that I certainly didn't want God to know about. I was impressed because what this prayer was saying to me was that God knew anyway without me saying anything to God and even without my wanting God to know. God knew. God knew the secrets of my heart. God knows the secrets of my heart right now. Pretty impressive, to say the least. What was terrifying and impressive to me as a child is now comforting and strengthening to me as an adult 
not simply because I am no longer planning the demise of my no longer wretched sister, but because I perceive within myself the desire to know and to be fully known and completely known by another. We pursue this in our human relationships. No matter how wonderful those relationships are, they fall short. And it is overwhelmingly strengthening and comforting to me to know that the God in whom we live and move and have our beings knows me better than I know myself, is closer to me than I am to myself, accepts and loves me more than I am able to love and accept myself. But as human beings, we need to know both aspects of this tension. We need to know that God is within us, yet beyond us, incarnate, yet transcendent, familiar, yet mysterious. We need to know that God is not subject to our destructive tendencies, that God's love is stronger than any rejection, any death, that God is faithful even when we are not. And the way in which we talk about God's otherness, God's transcendence, is through attempting to talk about life's mysteries and the miracles we experience in life, but can never fully explain. Here again, the tension between the familiar and the mysterious, God within us and God beyond us, incarnate and transcendent, was manifest most fully in Jesus the Christ. All of the human circumstances of Jesus' life were touched with mystery. Angel choirs accompanied his birth. An old man and an old woman prophesied in the temple. Simple meals were marked by parable and miracle. A walk down a country road led to someone being raised from the dead. This recognition that ordinary events in God's hands are touched with miracle and mystery is what we mean by sacrament. Within ritual, wondrous things happen. An old man might prophesy. An old woman might find her expectations fulfilled. The glory of God shines in the eyes of those who are in Christ, because around Christ, you can never trust water to be simply water, bread or wine to be only bread and wine, or words to hold still and keep their assigned place. There might be a revelation of God in these common things. Today, at St. Thomas in Hollywood, we dedicate ourselves to a capital campaign, the fruits of which we pray will honor our loving God long into the future after all of us are no longer on this earth. It is through the very concrete yet mysterious worship that is practiced here that people are able to experience the God who is at once incarnate and transcendent. There is a poetic description of God that really captures all that I'm trying to say. Originally written by the 12th century Archbishop Hildebert of Lavarden, it was quoted also by Madeline Lengel in her book, Walking on Water. It goes like this. God is over all things, under all things, outside all, within, but not enclosed, without, but not excluded, above, but not raised up, below, but not depressed, wholly above, presiding, wholly without, embracing, wholly within, filling. God is mysterious, yet familiar. God is beyond us, yet in our very midst. God is transcendent, yet incarnate. And for you and for me, faith in this God 
is a candle put into our hands by God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.